is privatization bad for the poor? Does it lead to a greater cost of living for ordinary South Africans? Hello, my name is Martin van Staden. I am the head of police here at the Free Market Foundation, and I am joined by our legal researcher, Zakel M. Tembo. Thanks for joining me, Zakes. Um, this is the second of three videos uh, that uh, we're doing on, uh, on this project. The first uh, uh, we did with Dr. Christoph Klein, which is the, who is the lead researcher in our privatization in practice project, which uh, is very generously uh, supported by the Con Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, in Germany. So, Zeke, uh, let's get into it. Um, let me start with this, this notion that privatization, this, this dirty word almost, that uh, what, once you say it, people conjure up these images of uh, uh, a big mustache twirling capitalist taking over what, what they say is our assets uh, as citizens of South Africa uh, and then using it exploitatively for their own self-enrichment at the expense of everyone no, else. Is privatization bad for the poor uh, or, or is, is there something else that's potentially even worse for the poor? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for having me. I think with, you know, the issue around privatization, it's, it's always interesting because like right now, you know, we have so-called states owned enterprises, you know, anyone who's familiar, well, we would be familiar with, you know, methodological individualism, you would know that everything comes down to individual actions taken by certain, you know, decision makers. And right now, South Africans would like to think that the state-owned entities, entities like ESCOM, for instance, are owned publicly by South Africans. But the reality is quite much more removed from that. The reality is that, you know, the decision maker who's responsible for ESCOM is most likely the one who can really, you know, say that they own it. And this is seen through the, 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 the corruption that can really is insurmountable at the state-owned entity. And that is caused by individuals who who work there, right? The state-owned entity that is publicly owned, but when it comes down to the reality of it, it actually is, you know, individually owned. It benefits certain individuals to the detriment of others as anyone who has a coal contract that transport coal to ESCOM or a maintenance contract. And all of those things would attest to that, that, you know, the, the, the benefit is supposed to be public, but really when you actually look into it, the benefit is private. And then there's the issue of, you know, everyone, even any South Africans still having to buy the electricity itself. So I think the conversation around, you know, privatization uh, seems to assume that what current, uh, the status quo is a status quo that is mutually beneficial or that is, you know, beneficial to the public and mass when that is not the case. Mm. But much more importantly is that, you know, we tend to, when something has not been owned by the state or has not been run by the state, we tend to not think of it as being privatized, but that is the essence of privatization, right? Mm. For people who, who will be watching this, you know, we... Lived in a, we live in a world where just less than two decades ago, you had to be extremely wealthy to have a cell phone, mm. like something, and the cell phones, they haven't something to write home about either. But for the mere fact that in just a space of two decades, everyone, even in a backwater, like, you know, so in the deep rural mm. parts of the world, you can have access to a cell phone and there's an infrastructure able to send signals to anywhere in the yeah. world. I, I find that to be one of the greatest benefits of privatization and no one is, you know, is out there in the world saying these capitalists don't want the poor to have cell phones mm. because the poor can already afford cell phones. Mm -hmm. But the reason that is the case is because that is one area of, you know, the modern economy that is, that has not been subject to high levels of regulation across various states in the world. Yeah. And even in states where, you know, these, this hardware is manufactured, you actually have the opposite of, you know, uh, regulation whereby uh, manufacturing hubs like Shenzhen in China, these are hubs that thrive off of having no regulation at all, right? So there is no board for cell phones anywhere that would be in the States or anywhere in Africa, hopefully. I, can, I hope so. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that shows the benefit of privatization. It shows what happens when private individuals are allowed to enterprise and to give the people what they need. So I think really it is a boogeyman, an understandable one, right? When you live in a, in a, in a country or in a world of by a large parts of the population are poor, mm. you would obviously, when you, you would think that the government, which supposedly has your interests in mind, will be the one to best safeguard your interests. But I'm like, if you actually were to objectively look at reality, you would realize that the reason, you know, most people have the things that they desire and need mm. is due to private actors. And the reason that the things that you desire and need are less accessible or scarce, most likely mm. will, you know, go back to the government doing something 
to prevent a private actor from doing that. So, you know, just a, a, a reevaluation of the conversation is what is needed. Yeah, no, I think that's an insightful point. It's that people maybe understandably, as you say, are, are kind of ambivalent about shaking the apple cart. So it's like the idea of ESCOM being private or the port of Durban, which is currently as a backlog of something like 70 ships that going to take, uh, I think Transnet said the, the 16 weeks or something more to, to just get that backlog of imports for our market done. That's so people thinking the port of Durban being privately owned, oh my goodness, that's, that's really rocking the boat. But as you say, people don't really just think that extra, that extra, uh, centimeter, mm-hmm. which is that the food we eat, the cell phones that we have, the computers that, that, are, that increasingly more people, uh, are, are having access to. These are all privately provided. What do we have in abundance is provided privately. And what we're really struggling with is supposedly provided publicly. So I think that's very insightful. And, and just to touch on uh, what you what you imply there about the private, privatize, uh, the, it's not that we privatize things, but things are kind of private by default already. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but but there is still the, this idea, um, so, so cell phones, you took for instance, and, and I mentioned food now, these things kind of have always been private, but then the, there's this idea that there are certain services that are kind of quintessentially state services. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the number one is security. The this, this state must provide law enforcement and security. But then there is in South Africa power, there is water oh, and so on. And, and uh, uh, the roads, as, as we in our, in our, uh, in our circle always know, there is this, uh, but, but who will build the roads? Who will maintain the roads? The state must do that. But as, what have we been seeing in, in South Africa specifically about these things, in my view, seemingly already being privatized, even mm-hmm. though in, if you open a textbook, it says this is the state's purview exclusively. Well, what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on that? I think, I think that's one of the best things really about the South African society in general, which is quite distinguishable from, I would say, other African societies, because as you interact with other people from other African societies, there, when the state collapses, there really is no recourse, right? Like mm-hmm. in the state, when, since it has centralized everything, when it collapses, there's no recourse. But in South Africa, as you mentioned, you know, the amazing things happen because security, the, you know, I'm, a, I'm an anarcho-capitalist, so I always hear arguments that security mm-hmm. is the purview of the state. But in South Africa, I don't think, even in townships, right, I don't think there's anyone who is in a way of community policing forums. So these are, you know, forums whereby communities willingly volunteer to go and do the job that is supposed to be done by the state, which is provide security to its citizens. So we are seeing aspects of, you know, an important, uh, an, an important factor of the state's activity, like security being mm-hmm. done by normal citizens. And then this gets much more intricate when you go to rural areas where Afro Forum has, you know, done amazing work where they have organized, you know, the rural communities around those areas for them to provide their own security, which is supposed to be, you know, a job of the state. Mm-hmm. Then you start seeing how privatization really as you, as you as you have touched on, it is it, it is natural. It is natural, and it is the public, uh, or at the very least, the statist collectivization of things that is unnatural. Because mm-hmm. you know, privatization does not necessarily protrude. You know, things like community policing forums, mm-hmm. and then there are you know multiple examples. As in South Africa, we have a problem, for instance, with energy. Right, we have a problem with load shedding, where we pay for energy and we seemingly do not get it. Yep. But let a capitalist do that, then we would never hear the end of it. Right, but. The solution to that, instead of having no power, you know, private businesses have invested in solar rooftop and including private households too, essentially privatizing something that was exclusively done by the state. And of course, the state is doing its utmost best to make it strenuous for you to do so, you know, through the regulations and the permits you have to get. But mm. for the effect so that, you know, you can buy solar panels from China and then buy a mm. battery and essentially have your own power generation units without the need of the state mm. is a beautiful thing. It mm. is something that we should encourage more of. And one would say that if there was no state currently monopolizing energy, you would have much more private actors into the space and being able to provide this energy, this energy that they would be producing to other members of, of society, right? Because we ideally don't want everyone to be generating their own power. That's because, mm. you know, if you are generating your own power, unless it's in a passive way, like through solar, mm. then really you are not doing other things and it yes. kind of defeats the, 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 the purpose of, you know, the division of labor and creating wealth. So really, okay. South Africans are, are quite determined to, they even go as far as, as repairing their own potholes, right? Mm. So they repair their own potholes, even though the government tries to make it as hard as it, as it possibly can for them to do so. But mm. you have insurance companies who repair 
potholes and you even have, you know, I'm sure private toll gates, toll, to, to toll roads. Right? So these yeah. are roads that were private to build and they're maintained through, you know, private payment by the motorists who, who pass on them. And I think the, the, the model already exists. Every time you hear of, you know, something cannot be done or should ought to be naturally done by the state, you really are looking at someone who right. has not truly figured out the, 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 the power that comes with Firstly, doing things by yourself and congregating with like-minded people to do things, you know, that you believe in, far removed from an administrative fellow in Pretoria or in Cape Town. Yes. And I think that South Africans embody that through their rooftop solar installations, through, you know, the repairing of their potholes, through their community policing fronts. And I hope that it expands to, you know, other avenues as well, so that we can have a real life example to show people that, you know, yeah. privatization does not necessarily mean that these things go away just means in most cases that not they are done much, much more better. Yes. Yeah, and I think uh, the, 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 the nice thing about being in South Africa is that a lot of people in our ecosystem, classical liberals, uh, free marketeers, Austrian, uh, in the West, they, they still have that kind of free occupation of, okay, yeah, but look, if, if security is privatized, uh, there is going to, uh, I think the argument of Robert Nozick was that there would, uh, one big security provider would emerge and he would, if uh, there would be a wars between them. But South Africa is such a, a good example of, no, it's, it's commerce and we have, we have more security guards in South Africa than we have soldiers and police combined. And these, they, they cooperate. They, uh, you often see on Facebook that the two security companies chase criminals together and Absolutely. they work together. So it just shows that the, the wonderful coordinating spontaneous order that comes out of people doing things voluntarily and privately isn't a boogeyman. It isn't like something to fear uh, the state. Maybe the state has a role, maybe it doesn't. But the fact is when something is done privately, it's not absolute chaos and collapse. And we see that. But something you touched on, Jake, and I think it's important is that the state feels threatened by, I mean, it's its, its own collapse in South Africa that's leading people to start doing things themselves. But even though it's the state is collapsing, it feels threatened by private the private sector doing uh, things. So we see initiatives like the partnership initiative, where a bunch of big businesses get together with go big, big government to work together. So the state is co-opting private business to try and bring it under the state's kind of fold. But then also in far kind of uh, uh, older ways, uh, the Competition Commission, I think, is a great example where using kind of uh, 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 markety sounding things. Uh, I, I remember at law school, we were taught that the competition commission exists to protect to the free it. market. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but in fact, what it does is, in my view, it, it's performing a rear guard action to kind of, uh, even though the state is collapsing, it is still trying to keep the private sector from responding properly. And we see this with, with some market inquiry. So what have you been noticing like from the, commi the, the competition commission and like antitrust law and how it's applied in mm -hmm. South Africa? To, to snuff out private sector economic activity. Yeah, 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 thank you for that. As you would know, I have quite the beef with the Competition Commission. So, oh, right. yeah, oh, man, where, where, where do I begin, right? I, I think your, 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 your comment about a rear guard action, right? Like, they, I think, I doubt it, they do this consciously, but they kind of represent some element of a vanguard action, if you think of it in Marxist terms, whereby you have these incredibly technical people who are, so, who, as you say, use marketing language, but mm they do it to the detriment of private enterprise. Firstly, like the idea that, you know, regulations will promote a free market, which is what the Competition Commission does. It applies regulations, yet the free market by definition is the, like the non-existence of regulations. So you, can then, so you cannot have an entity that is supposed to promote free markets inherently applying regulations to the private sector. It kind of is self-defeating, yeah. but much more egregious with the Competition Commission, right? It is, over the years, right, the Competition, the Competition Act was passed in 1998, and over the years it has been amended, it has grown in scope, if so were. And, and, and the growing scope of the, of the Competition Act means that the Competition Commission can also grow in a scope. And you mm. see this in this market inquiries, like the fresh market produce inquiry and a bunch of other inquiries, and also in this release of what they call reports. Right? There's this one report that really irks me which is called the essential food pricing report or something. It, is, it, it isn't legally binding, but the, the, the effects that it has on the market is that it tells the people who sell these things that they are seemingly doing something wrong because here is, you know, the Competition Commission monitoring essential foods. Even the idea of essential foods mm. too is quite laughable if you understand the, 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 
the, the, the subjective nature of a value, right? But, you know, the, the, composition, the Composition Commission seemingly is concerned with doing its utmost best to put as many barriers into private businesses as possible. So you have different uh, legislative, I would call functionalities or department being subsumed by the Composition Commission, right? For instance, I was recently, I was recently working on a public interest, co uh, on, public, on the recently draft public interest guidelines mm. that were released for merger control by the Commission. And they, in like public interest inherently includes things like BE ownership, which is covered by its own separate legislation. Yeah. And, you know, things that may touch on aff affirmative action, which has its own separate legislation and regulatory environment. Yet seemingly, as you have mentioned, the Competition Commission kind of subsumes all this with the end of reining in the private sector. Because, yeah. you know, when you, are, when you want to merge, for instance, and make your company bigger, if you're a security company, so that you yeah. cover maybe a bigger area, the Competition Commission will then come with a bunch of requirements that really shouldn't have nothing to do at all with competition, yeah. right? I may disagree with them, right? For, I may disagree with, you know, requirements for public interest and all of this, but if they are covered by, if they're already covered by another legislation, just like BEE and things like that, then it kind of becomes redundant when the Competition Commission does them themselves. But most importantly, it is the idea, the idea that, you know, in South Africa, be, be it through mergers, right? When you have a merger, you have to consider things that are outside the business environment. This will have a negative effect on our general economy because mergers are beneficial for, for, for yeah. you know, for an economy. And then with a piece of dominance, when you grow big enough, you will attract sanction. These generally send the wrong signals to the market, right? If you're a foreign investor and you want to invest in South Africa and possibly in, uh, have your company merge with one of the companies here, then that would be quite unattractive because the uncertainty of whether that merger will be approved or not, right, is something that you do not know and you have to invest money beforehand before you are able to realize that. And then other factors outside of this, 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 these technicalities, but more in broad strokes, I would think that the Commission Commission seemingly thinks of its mandate as directing the economy, yeah. which is counterintuitive to the economy they seek to regulate, which is a free market economy, an economy that is not directed by one singular actor. But the, the, the Commission has taken it upon themselves to direct different industries of the economy to determine whether this industry is competitive enough according to its subjective standards or not, mm. to determine whether, you know, uh, privacy disadvantaged people have enough ownership of certain enterprises and things like that. And I don't think that is their mandate. I think, you know, as a, as a regulator of a market economy, their only mandate is to ensure that as many people have the ability to contest in that market economy and the market economy mm -hmm. protects things like the freedom to contract and private property rights. But unfortunately, they do not do that. And as you say, they seemingly undermine the work that the private sector may possibly do or is currently doing to uh, essentially give to South Africans the services that uh, were currently under the purview of the state, right? Mm -hmm. Like right now, we don't know how the burgeoning energy market will look like with all these companies that are getting licenses from NERSA and are producing their own power. Soon enough, most likely they're going to attract a market inquiry from the Commission, Commission of Indoor. There has never been to this day a market inquiry into ESCO. Yes, that's fair. <laughs> as, I, I, uh, as we conclude, I mean, that's, uh, the, the Competition Commission effectively argues that its role is to, uh, it's this, this standard theory of private of, of competition, which is that the more competitors there are, the more it will drive prices down. And I think there is there's some value there, but ultimately the private, the, the competition commission thinks that it's there to drive down prices. But I think what we see is that the more it gets involved, the more things will get more expensive. You mentioned mergers. This is something, this is, a, whether or not the merger happens or whether a company is acquired uh, or whatever, that is a, a commercial decision. Sure. That is something that a board of directors of executives and managers decides based on their market analysis, their understanding of what consumers want. But the Competition Commission introduces a, a political element which necessarily distorts and interferes in that process. Which uh, and, and from the submission that you, you drafted for the Free Market Foundation recently, you also mentioned that the Competition Commission has this huge amount of discretion. It's almost like they, they publish these things like, We'll look at your BEA ownership and we'll look at your skills development credentials and then we'll kind of decide. That's true. And, and 
I mean, that uncertainty, uh, no, no business wants to operate in that environment when the government through the commission effectively says, we are not going to allow you to make commercial decisions. All your decisions must be politically uh, um, uh, kind of informed. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that's, uh, that's not the private sector that is making things expensive. It is the government with, with what I've now called is this rear guard action, trying to keep the private sector in such a, a corner and kind of snuff out anything that might threaten the state's dominance in the economy. And uh, on, on radio, I've called the Competition Commission an economic hitman for the government. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. but thank great, you, Sage. Yeah. That's this has been a very insightful discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, thank you for your time, and thank to you, you, viewers, thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, second episode in our privatization in practice uh, project. Uh, I've been Martin van Staden, head of policy here at the FMF, uh, joined by Zakele Mtembo, our legal researcher. Uh, please join us uh, for later installments and for the, all the other content that we'll be putting out on this project. Of course, remember to like this video, share it, uh, find our uh, various other social media uh, uh, platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. And please always visit our website, www.freemarketfoundation.com, where you can be kept up to date on all of our latest uh, developments. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter. But uh, yes, thank you again for joining us. And please remember, stay free.